Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Real Agriculture. I am at the Ontario Agricultural Conference, catching up now with Dr. Jeff Andreessen from Michigan State University. Sir, how are you doing? Very good, thanks. Awesome. Now, good to be here. We, uh, we're going to talk weather, Jeff, um, and some, some wild weather this year. And this is your focus and your, in your, your role at Michigan State. Um, maybe take a quick look through it at 2022 through the, uh, through the rear view mirror. I mean, like, it's wet dry and some serious blizzard conditions at the end of the year. Yeah, and, and well, as we know, wild weather, uh, the wild context is not usually not mm -hmm. favorable for, for ag. But in 2022, for, uh, for a good chunk of, of Ontario, of course, the, the problem was a lack of precipitation over an extended time and, and then gradually uh, increasing drought conditions during the growing season, which caused problems for mm -hmm. a, a number of people. It's a little bit better in the recent past here, but still, I think that's the big, certainly the big story. Yeah. Uh, and what about, you, you did a lot of time, you spent a lot of time in your presentation today breaking down that blizzard. Um, you know, give us a third little synopsis of what we saw there. Well, we saw one of the most intense events in our region for probably decades yeah. uh, in some ways. Uh, with, uh, but, but the extraordinary thing about it was how strong the system was itself, the uh, extended period of high winds. Uh, and cold right. uh, that we had with it. And, and as we, we saw, without the lakes there, it would have been significantly worse. But we, even so, we had wind chills, uh, again, minus 30 uh, in some cases, and uh, just for, and then very low visibility, so right. blowing snow for long periods of time that we typically don't see here mm. at this, uh, in this part of the world. And, but as I, I mentioned, uh, it, it probably could have been worse if we would have had more snow ahead of the system and the larger, larger areas would have been impacted. So uh, if there's any saving grace, yeah. it's, it, it could have probably been, been because of the intensity, uh, just, but a very, very unusual mm. and extreme event. I want to talk about some of the trends you identified in your presentation today. And, you know, first thing that really sort of grabbed me was, you know, temperatures are rising, nighttime temperatures are rising, daytime rise, uh, temperatures aren't rising at that, th that same level. What does that mean for us? It's, it's an interesting one, and it's, there aren't many places in the world that we see this, but the central part of North America is one that we do, and, and some of it probably has to do with our intensively agricultural landscape and, and, and loss of water through transpiration. But that said, uh, we, do, we are seeing more in terms of thermal accumulation, so we get a little bit more heat. Things are developing our crops a little bit more rapidly, but the, the good news is we also, at the other end, because of the maximum temperatures level and are not increasing very much, we don't see any evidence of things like increased heat waves. Right. That, that is, uh, is really not, we, we, we just don't see that yet. Other parts of the world, we have seen that, but not here. So that, I think that's a really positive thing. And of course, the warmer the temperature gets, the, the more water that can be lost. And, right. and that's also a very important factor as well. But because the, the temperatures, the daytime temperatures are steady, that's being kept in some check, mm. I think. Uh, you also mentioned declining ice levels on the Great Lakes. And I, I will mention that most of your data here is, is Michigan focused. And uh, what does that mean? I mean, that, how does that do, what does that, how does that impact springtime and right. fall? Well, we've had, uh, on average, uh, about a one degree Celsius warming over the last half century to a little bit more than that, and a lot of it's occurred during the cold season. Yeah. And so with warmer temperatures in the, in the wintertime, uh, there, of course, there are exceptions, but in general, we're seeing less ice for less time on the lakes than was the case uh, in, in the past, and that, that trend continues up to the present. It also means that the seasonal warm-up that we see in the spring which is influenced by how much ice, that also is becoming more variable yeah. and changing as well. And we hear a lot of talk here today about trying to plant early. Um, and you know, corn and soybeans, um, obviously that's, that, that's a good fit there, but probably not a good fit for some perennial crops. That, that's right, it, very important distinction. And one of the other key trends that we, we looked at, we can see that the, the last freezing temperatures of the spring season are, are becoming earlier with time. Uh, our seasonal warm-up is occurring earlier. And then the first freezing temperatures in the fall, those are getting later. Yeah. So we have a longer frost-free growing season. That's a big change. Two, maybe three weeks in some cases yeah. in our region. That's, that's, and so for the annual crops, that's a, huge, that's a huge deal. And it could be certainly taken advantage. It doesn't mean every year we'll see that. But the trend is, is definitely in that towards a longer growing season that's happening. And, and again, many of our annual crops could take advantage of that. 
now. You mentioned perennials. Perennials respond to their environment, and so what's happening with them is that they're coming out of their productive dormant states now a couple, two, three weeks earlier than they did a half a century ago. And of course, when they come out of that protective dormant state, they're more vulnerable to spring frost and freezes. And we've seen several examples of that here over the last mm -hmm. 10 to 20 years. And so that's, that's more of a troubling trend. Uh, what about extreme minimums? You talked about you're seeing extreme right. minimums. What type of impact can that have? And that one is mostly positive for, uh, and for, for our perennials, uh, but we're seeing along with these milder temperatures, especially during the winter, are extreme. The, the coldest temperatures we see in the winter, they're also getting warmer. And uh, it, it depends on the location, but two, three, four degrees Celsius warmer now on average than they were just 50 years ago. So the uh, hardiness requirements for many uh, crops or vegetation overwintering uh, are less now than they, they were in the past in our region because of that warming. You know, Jeff, you also talked about, you know, it's getting wetter. And, uh, you know, I think, you, again, you drew on your Michigan data to, uh, you know, we're looking at a 10 to 15 percent additional precipitation, right? I mean, that's... that's it's a huge, it's a huge uh, that's, I think, event. climate, statistically, that's the most significant trend that we see. And that, that one is true over, over large areas, most of the Great Lakes region as well. Uh, and uh, it basically, there's more water in the landscape. And I think for agriculture, uh, clearly the most important issue is, is that given the extra water, we're less likely to run out. Mm -hmm. And that, that abundance or lack of water is the primary factor determining the, the big bumps in yield or the, the, the declines in yield from year-to-year -year basis. So what it means is that, again, statistically, we're just less likely to run out when it really matters, and typically that's the mid to late summer, July mm -hmm. and August. And it doesn't mean we don't have droughts. We still have droughts, as we saw in 22. But statistically and climatologically, they're less frequent mm -hmm. and they're less severe than they have been in the past. Yeah. So that's, that's another piece of that as well. A hey, final question for you, and that is the, the, the question you get a lot of these <laughs> days, gives that, that outlook and, uh, for, for maybe the next three months. And I guess part of that conversation is you know, a, a third La Nina yeah. winter, a third in a row here. What are we looking at uh, in, in terms of that going forward? For well, this as you mentioned, it's pretty unusual to have three, El Nino, or three La Nina events in a row. It's only happened twice mm -hmm. uh, since the middle of last century and what we do. Uh, and given that, there is a statistical likelihood or a, a, certainly a, a direction towards what are the normal right. conditions here for the, for the middle and latter part of the winter, especially and into the early spring. And uh, that also maybe means a little bit additional snowfall, statistically. Mm -hmm. I'd, some people may not be happy about that. But more importantly, I think, for the areas that were impacted by the drought, that I think that's good news. And we, we obviously need, we need water and moisture to recharge. And so that forecast is favorable, at least points in the right direction, mm -hmm. for, for replacing some of that water that was lost right. uh, last year. Well, Jeff, hey, uh, really appreciate you taking some time for Real Agriculture today. Uh, great presentation today. Thanks for your time. Appreciate that. Thanks.